and this will withdraw the bowel and then pack about three uh, mops will help us achieve uh, uh, hemostasis because the abdomen temporarily and then go to ICU and then return later to do uh, x fix Head trauma, neuro trauma is important to remember the anatomy of, 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 of whatever is in the head, starting from the scalp, the skull, the meninges, the substance of the brain, the ventricles. It's important to remember to keep the anatomy of, 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 of the head at the back of your minds. A very highly richly vascularized scalp and then uh, the associated structures. Uh, now, the pathophysiology many times in head trauma lies uh, in this Monroe Kelly doctrine. The Monroe Kelly doctrine states that the skull, especially in adults, is a very limited cavity. It's fixed, it's a fixed limited cavity. It already contains blood, vessels, both arteries and veins. It already contains uh, the brain and it has ESF. So there's no extra space for you to add anything. Should you add a space for spying lesion like, uh, like, like, like a mass, like you know, a hematoma, subdural, epidural, then the brain will initially try to compensate to maintain a normal intracranial pressure, but soon it will give up, especially if the mass gets higher. And then some, some contents, the skull have to be forced out. Many times the CSF, many times the brain, and now if you begin forcing the brain uh, through uh, orifices in the skull, uh, and then you start compressing some of the vital centers, cardiac respiratory centers, this kind of thing, that's how you get the principle of subtentorial coning. That's how you're gonna die, because you're compressing cardiac respiratory centers. So it is uh, crucial that you keep this monochary doctrine and the expanding masses in, in, in in the skull at the back of your mind as you address uh, pathologies related to uh, trauma to, to, to the brain. The other pathophysiological uh, equation you need to keep at the back of your mind is this equation, cerebral perfusion pressure. Cerebral perfusion pressure is mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. Mean arterial pressure you, factor, you calculate as a factor of the systole and you know, the desk. Intracranial pressure should be fixed and in low, a low value. So if you play around with this equation, you want to maintain a good cerebral perfusion pressure. You need a distant arterial pressure and a normal stable uh, intracranial pressure. When you start to, to, to increase arterial pressure, if you have a normal cerebral perfusion and normal intracranial pressure, then you're going to have a high cerebral perfusion pressure. It's not good for you. If you have, for example, hypertensive bleed, so a patient who is bleeding and is both hypertensive, then it's going to bleed worse. It's going to bleed worse. So similarly, you don't want your cerebral perfusion pressure to be low because you don't want cerebral ischemia and you don't want cerebral hypoxia. You don't want cerebral ischemia. So you want to keep your intracranial pressure low. So some of the procedures, and the reason you see a neurosurgeon or a surgeon going to the theater is going to compress your cranial tummy, to do a craniectomy, to do a bubble's cranial stomach is because they want to keep the intracranial pressure low. You always want to keep the intracranial pressure within normal node ranges so that you maintain a good cerebral perfusion pressure. So it's important to keep this equation at the back of your mind as you deal with uh, the consequence of physiology of, of, of traumatic brain uh, injury. So I have seen patients die because they had lacerations of the scalp. The scalp is very richly uh, vascularized, and if you do not control the origin of the scalp, you can easily. And with lacerations that can, uh, they had the skull usually fractured, depressed fractures of the skull, or fractures of the cranium and the skull base, the meninges, uh, epidural, subdural, and subarachnoid. Uh, Hemorrhages and then the diffuse axonal injuries in the brain and cerebral uh, leads, commonest injuries. In this picture, you can appreciate, I think, an epidural hematoma here, uh, right here, and on the other side, you can appreciate uh, a subdural hematoma with a shift of midline structures of the brain to the opposite side.
So surgical intervention, the neurosurgeon, uh, many times the genosurgeon, the country, the scalp lacerations, they are doing major surgical toilets and the suture to achieve hemostasis uh, for depressed fractures of the skull. You're doing skull elevation, you're doing craniotomies, you're doing craniotomies. And uh, you want to achieve hemostasis. You know, you want to achieve hemostasis, this is the goal. And you plan for your patient preoperatively, intraoperatively, postoperatively. Preoperatively, you want to make sure they are not hypertensive. If they are, the blood pressure is controlled. If you have time, you have a good PTI in that. Intraoperatively, you control the process. The adrenaline saline, you inject in the scalp. You achieve hemostasis with electrocautery. Sometimes we get uh, peroxide soft gauze, uh, bone wax on the scalp, uh, suturing, uh, obvious bleeders. Uh, and then you make sure you can use Sagisil, you know, Sagisil can leave some of those beds and leave drains. So you always want to achieve hemostasis because it's an embarrassment for you to do a surgery as significant as a craniotomy. And then you reaccumulate uh, uh, content uh, in that space after you've done the procedure. So you make sure you meticulously really achieve hemostasis uh, for, for these, uh, you know, neurosurgical procedures. Musculoskeletal trauma, yes, you can see this picture. This is an X-ray. We have diastasis here, and we have a diastasis here of the pubic bones, and it's an open book fracture. This is a fracture that usually is associated with plenty of bleeding, both from the bony surfaces of, 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 of the, of the fractured, uh, fractured uh, parts of, 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 of the pelvis and from the the sacroplexus, the plexuses of blood vessels that traverse this bony pelvis. So this pelvis has to be bound. Hmm? Pelvic binders like this exist, and all local you can use a bed sheet and wind it around and achieve pelvic binding. Or if we fail, we may need to do a damage control X-fix of the pelvis. Or if we fail, many times the orthopedic is not around, we go to a laparotomy with a lower midline incision and do pelvic peritoneal packing. With peritoneal parts, we we'll remove up at least uh, 24 to 30 hours later. Uh, spinal trauma, yes, please know that spinal trauma can exist. And the biggest consequences of having spinal trauma is the spinal shock in the injury or in the long term having transection of the spinal cord. So always keep the spinal cord uh, aligned. Uh, I think I'm running out of time. So I'll cruise through uh, some of this slide left, you can have major arterial hemorrhage from life-threatening extremity injuries. You have, uh, you know, uh, transection, uh, you know, fractures involved in the lower limbs, uh, involving major vessels there, and can have serious catastrophic hemorrhages from that. Uh, there's a role for use of a tourniquet, briefly, but you have to be very careful as you use tourniquets, not really to surpass tourniquet time and instead cause acidosis. Uh, uh, you get a quick surgical consult, uh, you assess and reassess the pulses. Sometimes there's what they call a mangled extremity, and you have a mangled extremity, you make a decision between amputation or not. Uh, this is a mangled extremity severe score that I haven't put here that you can deploy to, 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 to be able to, to deal with that. Uh, yes. There's a crash syndrome, crash syndrome when you have gross muscle injury or gross muscle ischemia and you release huge volumes of myoglobin. I think we see many of these in, uh, in uh, electrical bands and this kind of thing that can give you acute renal failure. So you need to look out for that. And you need to, to have a quick computation of the urinary output and make sure you maintain a good uh, fluid balance chart make sure you deal with this. Compartment syndrome is another demon in uh, trauma. And uh, you have a patient with pain out of proportion to the injury, you know, they have tenseness of the compartment in the area where they have this pain. Uh, you have a symmetry of muscle components. You, you lack distal pulses, you know, and we do not have capacity to measure intra into a compartmental pressure routinely, but we may need to do, we shall need to do a partial to save that deep 
because the neurovascular structures traverse that compartment have been compressed by sedimentary swollen uh, uh, a muscle that is swollen against a fascial layer that is not expansive. So compartment syndrome is something to look out to. Bands, yes, bands. It's worth noting, bands in itself is a whole big topic, but I have only one slide on bands. You have extremes of temperature, the very cold, the very hot. Uh, very cold, you have trench food, frostbite, frost nip. Very hot, you have uh, the contact bands. You have, um, you have um, flame bands, then you have liquid bands from liquids or fluids, uh, scalds. Electrical bands are terrible, depending on whether it's a alternating current or direct current, chemical bands, uh, maybe alkali bands being worse than acid bands. But the physiology of the band wound remains the same, that there are three zones. There is a zone, a central zone of coagulation, which is irreversible. Tissue here is dead, there's nothing to do about it. You have to debride. Then there's a, a zone there that you can salvage if you debride and resuscitate properly, a zone of stasis. The zone of hyperemia is usually okay. So the goal in management of bands usually as we deploy Parkland formula and rapid uh, debridement, giving antibiotics, very good dressing. As we deploy all those things, we want to, to be able to, to, to save the zone of stasis. We want to salvage that as much as possible. So the physiology of the plant is this at the back of your mind. Ascaratome, yes, circumferential bands involved in the trunk that could limit the expansion of the chest. You may have to do ascaratome as is demonstrated. Uh, in this picture. Uh, yes, there are special groups of people that we need to pay attention to when we have trauma situations, pregnancy, the very elderly, the pediatric, because of alterations in their physiological volumes of, of reserves and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it's important to note for that, that every time you receive a, a, a young lady, a lady of childbearing, yeah, in the secondary survey, you have to be seen at least to do a pregnancy test because when we begin working with a pregnant lady uh, as a patient, as a victim of media trauma, you realize that, that the physiological volumes are a bit different. So yes, there are those special groups that have just hinted them so that keep them at the back of our minds. And of course, we cannot leave this topic without talking about acidosis, coagulopathy, and, and hypothermia. This is a trial of death. One can they interact with each other, they overlap. You have a coagulopathy, you can end up with an acidosis. You have an acidosis, you can end up with a hypothermia. You have another hypothermia, it can lead to an acidosis. So it's important for you to take uh, note of that. Uh, sometimes we have to give a lot of blood. You find yourself in situations where you have to replace maybe an entire blood volume within 24 hours of more than 10 units of packed red blood cells within 24 hours, or more than 20 units of packed red blood cells within 24 hours, or more than four units within an hour, or replacement of the person of entire blood volume within three hours. These are massive transfusion protocols. And different hospitals, different settings have different ways to approach massive transfusion. When you're giving these big volumes of uh, these blood and blood products within a very limited time, Many times, different hospitals will tell you, give this blood together with the pressure for plasma, together with, okay? So it's important to have, because of the issues associated with massive transfusion, it does not come uh, without complications. There are, there, are, there are those that are immediate and those that are delayed, okay? Hyperkalemia, hypothermia, stosis, and then you can get sepsis and transfusion-related lung injury, the delayed ones. So, these protocols, so each, each hospital, I would advise that they have their own massive transfusion protocols because they're based on the stuff you have, how much blood you have in the blood bank, and eh, okay, what you have at your disposal to help uh, in the interaction of the treating clinicians and the blood bank to ensure judicious use of blood and blood components. So by developing local agreed and specific guidelines that include clinical laboratory and blood bank and logistical response clinicians can ensure effective management of uh, massive blood loss and improve uh, outcome. So now, these are the references. Together with a team of some other surgeons, there is um, there's a website here, and I would, I would encourage you to visit it because it has three 
uh, resources we developed together with the team. Uh, uh, the Kampala Trauma, Kampala Trauma, Advanced Kampala Trauma Training. Uh, it exists there, Advanced Kampala Trauma Course. We have demonstration on uh, the routine ATLS procedures in there, and you can visit an important resource. And this year we expect the 11th money of the ATLS, I think. Uh, I think I will end my discussion here. My time is well spent. Uh, I thank you so much, and I'm sorry for, for staying too long. Dr. Mukembo, back to you. Wow. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ronald. It's indeed a very wonderful presentation from you. And uh, you have really done justice to the participants. And uh, there were several comments appreciating your presentation. And uh, some were saying learning is ongoing seriously. Indeed, you have been clear and elaborate about uh, the common surgical issues that arise in trauma patients. I know there are those, the bruises, the small wounds that need stitching here and there, those can be seen on another discussion. So we want to thank you, uh, Dr. Ronald, for this very wonderful presentation. Once again, I want to thank you, our participants, for choosing to associate with the Busoga Health Forum and for staying on until now. We are going to use the next 10, 15 minutes to receive your queries or questions regards regarding the presentation. Kindly let your question be in line with the presentation such that we can respond to it. And then we move the next issue. Uh, I'll pick a question from Mr. Koma Akim. Kindly unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Hello. Good evening. Hello, are you hearing me? Yes, yes. we can. Good evening, Dr. Koma, good to see you. Yes, yes. I, I just want to say thank you to my friend, Dr. Kiwewa. I haven't seen him for a long time. I've also seen Dr. Mubezi Isaac, my schoolmate at Zambia. My name is Dr. Akim. I come from South Sudan, but currently in Nairobi. And I'll say, Dr. Ronald, thank you very much for the presentation. I flew in when I saw it on Twitter. So I say my friend is presenting. So let me come and hear what he has to present. I came along with one of my colleagues, Ronald Jada. He was uh, in Makere University. I think I, one year ahead of you. He was also attending uh, from South Sudan. So thank you. I have just one or two comments to make uh, regarding thoracic injury. You talk briefly about it, but not in much detail. But I wanted to say that yes, uh, in our setting, and also I think in US, where there are very few uh, cardiothoracic surgeons, uh, it's important that the, the, the attending surgeon has some idea on how to, to do a, a thoracic a damage control surgery, because in most cases, you might not be able to refer this person either to Zambia or to Mulago, where the cardiothoracic surgeons are based. So it will be important that, that we learn basic principles of opening the chest and doing some, some damage control surgery, particularly the pulmonary hilar twist uh, maneuver, and also suturing the helium or indeed the heart if it is torn and the patient is bleeding and they have arrested on table because of hypovolemic shock or indeed other injuries. So I think uh, we need to emphasize that, that going forward as surgeons, we, we have to really learn some of these things, especially where you are in Bali. I don't think there's a cardiothoracic surgeon uh, or even in Ginja or indeed in any other uh, Western or Northern district of Uganda. So my comment is that it, it's important that we learn this and there are, there are courses uh, the, the ICRC call, uh, ICRC International Committee of the Red Cross, Red Crescent is conducting some trauma, a diploma in trauma, in trauma surgery in Lebanon, but because of the war in Lebanon, it has stopped a bit. 
I would encourage that more surgeons in Uganda should attend those courses and will give them a lot of uh, a lot of skills. In, 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 you don't have to wait for Dr. Mugisa or, or indeed any other kind of thoracic surgeon in Lago to, to do some of these things. So you can you can do it. Well, and indeed we can do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kim. Thank you, Dr. Kim. for that comment and good to see you. Yeah, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Almost thank four you years. very much. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thank you. It's a pleasure hearing from you. Greetings to uh, people in Nairobi. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure always having you join us. Thank uh, you. Dr. Ronald, uh, Dr. Hello. Yes, please. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ronald Chiwewa. And thank you very much, Dr. Mukembo. And thank you for giving up the overview of how to manage trauma, traumatic uh, complications that may erupt following uh, uh, injuries, wherever they may occur. I had uh, my colleague uh, making a comment about thoracic injuries. In Mulag, actually, we have a very fledged ward, which I actually had, and uh, we actually attend some, so, to most of the thoracic injuries. Although one of the comments that I would wish to make is that um, uh, in trauma, unless there is any specific uh, indication we rarely do emergent thoracotomies. Reason being that the outcome is not always very good yet when we manage them conservatively, especially if we are certain and sure that we are not bleeding from any big vessel, then we really, we have actually come out with very good outcomes. And some of them are actually self-limiting. Unless those ones that are extreme and they, we usually go in, and either using the abdominal approach, like if we have diaphragm, diaphragmatic injuries. Yeah, I know we have also had some right diaphragmatic injuries with displacement of the liver into the chest. And we have actually, those are the times we have done thoracotomies and the, the outcomes have been good. But with blood vessels, apart from the intercostals, sometimes that may be bleeding following our rib fractures, but we rarely get our valves are great vessels. And even when they happen, those one will be attended to in the Heart Institute because they were they are the ones that are managing the cardiac and the, the great vessels. But rather as large and large, large and by, by and large, uh, most of the thoracic injuries are managed best conservatively until really there's a need to go into the chest because that surgery actually is very hectic to the patient and sometimes uh, even the outcomes when you open up the chest are uh, worse than they were before. So, but one of these days when we get time, we shall go through them and we see how, how we are managing them in Mulago. And I thank you very much, Ronald. And surely you've been uh, very uh, informative in your presentation and educative. And we ask you to come back again the Baganda say nera nera nera. We also have also say chiongero. That's what it means. Thank you very much. God bless everybody who is in attendance. Thank you, Dr. Kaweru. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaweru. Dr. Kaweru is a, a consultant surgeon and a cardiothoracic surgeon based at Mulago Hospital. We are glad whenever you join us and you are a very key pillar in the Soda Health Forum CME series. Those who have been asking for the CPD link, it has been shared in the chat group. Please remember to register so that you don't miss your CPD points, especially the doctors. The allied health workers, we shall soon register with the allied council and we will soon start accrediting your points. There has been a link provided for those who need uh, the slides. And if you want to listen to our previous presentation is under the Sobga Health Forum, feel free to follow the link which has been provided to our website. You can listen, the recordings are always uploaded there. You can download the slides and you go through them 
in your free time. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Ronald, there was a... Uh, yeah, there was a uh, uh, please please don't dismiss me. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was a there was a question from uh, from uh, a member that comment about the use of uh, IV fluids in people with head injuries, and uh, relatedly, somebody another member was asking to comment about the use of mantle in head injuries. Another member still in relation to IV fluids was asking about the use of hypertonic saline. How do we use it? When do we use it? Uh, I'm sure you will give good reply to that answer, that question, sorry. And then uh, uh, another member asked a question, uh, was asking you to comment about the, the, the when we do, I think this was a question from Mr. Okorach. Mr. Okorach, you had three questions. Would you like to ask them directly? Dr. Okorach? Dennis? You had three questions. One was- Yes, very yes, yes. Kind yes, Dr. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you for having me online. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Ronald, for the wonderful presentation. Um, I, I wanted to know uh, how far maybe with the advancement in the manage management of the frail chest where it left uh, the use of male towel clip. Uh, that was my first question. And then uh, my second question, uh, my second question comes in, uh, uh, in the, at some point you talked about evacuation of the hemoperitoneum. And I, re I remember during our internship time when we were having a, uh, maybe ruptured ectopic and the rest who are actually leaving that hemoperitoneum. Are there situations when we are to evacuate and not maybe evacuate the hemoperitoneum? And then the, the third one I had, uh, I think uh, maybe the problem was my network, but I think I had a breakage in the voices and the network was not quite well. So I missed when he was talking about the windows in the CFAS, the, uh, the focus, uh, sonography in trauma. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Amos from uh, Lira Regional Refer Hospital. Dr. Ronald, would you mind to first respond to those before we pick another set? Thank you. Yes. Uh, I think, uh, let me respond to those. Now, fluids in head injury, I'll still refer you back to my equation for cerebral perfusion pressure mean arterial pressure and intracranial pressure. So when you have a head injury and you have a bleed, an intracranial bleed, you do not want to make your cerebral perfusion pressure so high. If you give too much fluid, then you're going to make your cerebral perfusion pressure too high and you're probably going to worsen the bleed that you already have. So you, you, you want to maintain a perfusion pressure, that's okay, but you want to give your fluids uh, a bit uh, carefully because of that general equation that I showed. Uh, you don't want to raise the cerebral perfusion pressure too high because too high, then you're going to, to continue bleeding and you already have a bleeding problem. Uh, as a general principle for fluids in resuscitation in trauma, I have to say that the most ideal fluid in trauma, because I told you that the commonest cause of shock in trauma is hypovolemic shock due to hemorrhage, the most ideal fluid now they preach in trauma should be, should be blood. Ideally, you'd want to replace blood with blood, but circumstances do not allow for that to happen. We don't have it in ambient amounts. So many times we have crystalloid, and when we choose crystalloid, which one would you want to choose? Probably lactated ringers. It confers more advantage. It has more electrolytes, okay? In addition to giving you volume, it will give you those added advantages. Hypertonic saline seems to be uh, taking over, it has demonstrated in research, uh, uh, I think an advantage over Manitou in management of the increased intracranial pressure in, in hereditary patients. And it also helps with stabilizing of uh, uh, sodium. It reduces on intracerebral edema better than uh, 
better than Manitou does. So I have a feeling that maybe in the next five years, you'll see protocols uh, where Manitou is no longer being used for management of raised intracranial pressure. Hypertonic saline, I think, is taking over for those comfort advantages. Uh, flail chest, uh, flail segments, if you have a very wide flail segment, you have to control that segment. You, want, you don't want that segment to give you paradoxical, paradoxical uh, uh, breathing. So uh, what we have done usually is to have some sort of compressive uh, addressing that will reduce the paradoxical nature of that um, of that uh, of that breathing. Uh, sometimes we could go an extra mile. That is an immediate post-traumatic time. It could be an extra mile. I don't know if Dr. Hawaii will comment on that if you want. And sort of repair the ribs to try to approximate them, especially if it's too gross. But many times we don't repair uh, uh, these ribs. We just want to take away that paradoxical nature of breathing that interferes with the uh, blood pressure. Uh, hemoperitoneum, yes, there was that preaching that you don't need to drain it all, but why leave it there, you know, especially if it's going to conceal some of the bleeders that you have. Remember, blood is a constant irritant of the peritoneum. You leave blood there, then your patient is going to be in pain. One of the reasons patients are in pain with peritonitis is because blood is a known irritant of the peritoneum. So you have a hemoperitoneum there, unless there's something gross preventing you from leaving it to some huge advantage of leaving it there. I think you drain your hemoperitoneum. Uh, there's no problem. It's already gone, you know, unless you can reuse it for autotransfusion, but many times maybe not. You don't have the facility to receive that blood. You drain the hemoperitoneum. It's going to remain a constant uh, irritant of, of the peritoneum and your patient will be in pain because of that. Uh, the windows of the first scan, now the traditional first scan had four windows. The first window is the subcephoid window. You angle the probe of your uh, uh, ultrasound towards uh, the pericardial uh, area. You want to look for pericardial uh, effusion, pericardial tamponade. The second window is the right upper quadrant or areas around there. You want to look at the interface between the diaphragm and the superior and, and, the, and the superior aspect of the liver. And significantly, you want to look at the interface between the, the, the superior edge of the liver and the, I mean the inferior edge of the liver and the superior edge of the right kidney, which is the Morrison's porch, and they extend it a bit to look at the right paracolic gutter. That is window number two. Traditional window number three is on the opposite side on the left. You want to look at the interface between the diaphragm and the spleen. And usually this is a pathological spleen. The normal small spleen usually that may not be consequential. Or you want to look at the interface between the spleen and the superior pole of the left kidney. This is a splenorenal recess. Usually can have collection of blood there. And this window can be extended to look at the left parabolic gutter. The fourth window, traditionally in the past, looks at its suprapubic. It's angled, you know, towards, you know, distally. It's angled distally, uh, the probe. And it's intended to look at the interface between the bladder and, and the prostate in men, or the bladder and, and, and the uterus in women, which is the Douglas. These are potential areas for collection of probe. We have uh, situations where you, you run the probe on the lateral aspects of the rib cage, and you want to look for pneumothorax. You can see pneumothorax, you can see pneumothorax, fluid collection in the chest, and you can see rib fractures. That is the extended uh, first. I don't know if this addresses uh, the first you know, group of, of concerns. That, uh, that's my submission. Dr. Mukembo to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ronald, for that wonderful feedback. I hope, uh, Dr. Amos, you sorry, Dennis, you've been answered. There are those of you having challenges with the registration link for the CPD. I remind you that this is a Google document. Sometimes the challenge is with your uh, Google settings. If they are not updated or there are challenges with them, you may fail to access the 
the document. Nevertheless, keep trying. You will succeed in case you fail. You inbox us on, on WhatsApp. We will be able to help you correct that challenge. Doctors, I remind you, if you don't have an active online portal account with UMDPC, then the Google document won't help you. You won't get the points on your dashboard. So ensure you have an active online account with UMDPC where the points can be put. Otherwise, registering and then demanding points without an active account doesn't really help you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, Dr. Amos feels you answered him very well. Greetings to people in Lira. Uh, members, in the case there is any question, there was a question from a member about uh, a distinction between uh, cerebrospinal fluid and mucus. I think in the case of fracture base of the skull, uh, this question has been answered in several presentations here, but Dr. Ronald, perhaps you may want to give him uh, uh, a, a, an answer to that. How do you differentiate that this patient is leaking CCF and not mucus? Maybe a quick reply to that member. Well, I don't know how often you see mucus leaking in a patient who has uh, open head injury. By the time you leak CSF, by the way, you have an open head injury. It means dura has been torn. So you're leaking CSF. I don't know how many times you see mucus leaking nonstop uh, in a patient who has uh, open head injury, but CSF will until after some days. It's clearer, mucus is more mucoid. CSF is not mucoid, it's a clearer fluid in the normal individual. So I don't know if this helps answer. I don't know if you want to go into laboratory tests to look at the components of CSF and then compare with those of mucus. But many times you want to make a quick clear cut, uh, a clear cut uh, uh, distinction between CSF and, and mucus. Mucus will be thicker. Uh, mucus will not leak endlessly in a head injury patient. And if you have an opportunity to do a rhinoscopy, uh, to look in there, and you have a, you know, some, 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 some gadget that can like, you know, torch, you'll see this fluid flowing endlessly from, from, from the nostrils. I don't know if somebody has a better answer than they could submit, but I do not think one that CSF will be as thick as, as, as mucus is. And two, I do not think it will leak endlessly. And uh, three, if you wanted to, to keep comparing, then you have to go to the lab at the known components of CSF that has, you know, mucus. I don't know if somebody has a better submission. I see Dr. Kim wants to yes. comment. Yes, yeah, I, th I think Dr. Ronald mentioned most of the important differences between mucus and CSF. But one that I wanted to mention is if you use a handkerchief to, to remove it for from your nose, CSF will never clot or will never stick on the handkerchief, but mucus will definitely uh, stick. So that is the difference uh, in addition to what Dr. Ronald has already said. But of course, if you want to, to prove beyond doubt that this is not CSF, but mucus, then you have to do microbiological or histological tests. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim, for that supplement. Uh, I think uh, the member needs to know that, uh, yes, it may need you to do biochemical analysis, which may not be necessary in the emergency situation. In your clinical judgment, you will have to look at uh, the secretion and you judge if you have seen mucus, you'll be able to tell maybe from the viscosity and the the, the nature of how the two look, you will easily tell.